Hey everyone, Ryan Young, Kama Jiu-Jitsu. I got a question from a gentleman out in Arizona asking the question about sandbagging. Well, first of all, what is sandbagging? Sandbagging is simply a term that pretty much everyone knows about. And it's simply the, I guess the belief that someone, a professor or an instructor, is deliberately holding back a belt from a student for the purpose of giving them an edge in competition. That's all it is. That's all sandbagging is. Sandbagging is just a way to get that competitive edge. Now, it's not the only way to get an edge. There are a number of ways that people try to get an edge. If you think about competitive competition jiu-jitsu, for instance, it's just like any sport, right? They're gonna do sandbagging. They're also gonna do PEDs, right? What are PEDs? Performance enhancing drugs. They're going to do extra conditioning, as far as I can see, or you know, they're, they're maybe going to just work, uh, work hard on their technique. So how can you get better and beat your opponent? Well, how can you get that edge? Well, it could be through sandbagging, meaning lying about your belt rank, or just simply not giving somebody a rank that in any other situation, if they were not competing, that they would otherwise have. Performance enhancing drugs, yes, we talked about that. Conditioning, if you're just a better athlete, you can go harder, you can go longer, and you can outlast your opponents at a very high level. And lastly, to me most importantly, is to simply get your technique up and running and get it better than your opponents. So, let's see for a second. <clears throat> In particular, let's talk about sandbagging. So the way I learned about sandbagging was from a former instructor of mine, and he had a particular athlete who was very good, very good in competition. He was top level um, at the blue belt level, at the purple belt level, the brown belt level, and at black belt, he's among the elites right now. But we were talking about it particularly when he was a purple belt. The reason is because he was probably an 18 or 19 year old purple belt. He was phenomenal. He was among the elite in the purple belt level. And in, in tournaments, he'd do pretty well. He'd win some, he'd, he'd usually be at, in the, on the podium, uh, but wouldn't often be first place, but would, would take first place pretty frequently. But in the academy, and when training with other people, he would pretty much beat black belts. I wouldn't say he was necessarily black belt level, but if there were those low hanging fruit black belts, the ones that were not really top of their game, um, I, wouldn't call, I wouldn't say they were, they were fake black belts like we talked about in, in, our, in another video, but they were just among the black belts that weren't the top level ones. Let's just put it at that. You have track one. Track one is your regular Joe. Jiu Jitsu practitioner. Track two is your competitor. Now they're gonna be on different belt tracks. So if you're a competitor, your belt track is gonna be different than if you're a regular Joe. If you're a regular Joe, it's more true to technique as we like to call it. So if you've gone through the criteria and you've earned what it takes to earn a blue belt as a regular Joe, you'll get it. As a competitor, you'll still be a white belt. Because why? Other schools are doing it too. It doesn't matter if the guy you go up against, or your, the guy your, school, your student goes up against in a competition gets wiped all over the mat and you say, he is obviously not a blue belt, or he's, he's obviously not a white belt. You look at his technique, he's a purple belt. Well, yeah, true, but other schools are doing the same thing with their belts, with their students. So really, it's a type of thing where do you want your blue belt, let's say, to get annihilated by other blue belts, right? You want your competitor to have the chance to get onto the podium. If he doesn't have a chance to be on the, on the podium, it gets to be kind of demoralizing. Competition is not a fight. Let's just, let's just put that out of the way here. It doesn't mean that your opponent cannot fight. It just means that given the rules of the tournament, sometimes he's just out of his league. So it really makes sense for schools to concentrate on one or the other. Or what they'll do is they'll have a separate competition team. So these are for their more dedicated athletes or the ones that want to compete and they want to make it a regular thing to compete. Those are the students that are going to be your best students 
especially when you take rank into account. So if you have your blue belt competition team, they'll probably be, be better than your regular Joe purple belts because they just have to be. If they go in, if they're really ranked as they should be, meaning they're ranked a purple belt and they were to go in, they'll get destroyed. That's a simple fact. And that's just how competitions are. Because when you think about it, money is involved here. Not in the, not in the actual competition itself, but in the school, in the school owner, right? That, that school owner wants to have all those medals that his, that his team wins to display because it's a marketing thing. And if he can tell a prospective student, hey, look, look at all these competitions that we've won. Look at all these medals that we've won. Is there their legitimacy tool to their customer, potential customer? In which case, the, the potential customer will go, wow, hmm. You know, I went to another school prior and they only had a case with 10 medals in it. And they've been in existence for 10 years, whereas you have a case with 100 medals in it and you've only been around for five, right? So the, what's the customer gonna think? Correctly or not, they're gonna think, wow, school two with the 100 medals is the better school, I wanna go there. So that's how he brings in, brings in his students. Well, what happens to school number one? Maybe school number one is the better school. The, 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 the guys who come out of that school are, maybe they're better fighters. Maybe they don't win as, as much of the competition. For if you match up time-wise, you know, a guy who's been training two years, four years, five years, and you match them against the other school with all the medals, the guy with only you know, 10 medals in his case versus 100, his guys beat his other guys straight up all the time. That's based on time. Well, what happened? The guy with the fewer medals, his guys are true to belt. So maybe he's putting a purple belt against a guy who's you know, a blue belt over there, time-wise, and his guy's actually better. But that person who's competing in blue really should be, maybe he's a lower level purple, but he's still competing in blue and he's doing well in competition. So that's really all it is. It, it, you know, I hate to put it this way, but it does come down to money, right? The more successful teams in competition, will often be the larger schools in just in, in absolute size. Not all the time, but it is often the case. Um, as far as self-defense side, nah, because competition is not how we're, how we're measured. Um, you know, but with regard to competition schools, the biggest schools with the biggest teams often are the ones that are the most successful and sandbagging is the way to do it. Now, let me ask you this though. If everyone is sandbagging their belts, does that make it a problem? Only for those who don't buy into the strategy. If you're a school and you rank true to belt and your students go in and they get annihilated in competition because everybody else is sandbagging, you know, the purple belt you're sending in is really going up against a guy who should be a brown or a black belt and gets destroyed. It, it's unfair to you, but if everybody else is doing it, that's just the way the game is played. That would mean that if you expect to be successful in competition, you have to do the same thing. The same thing with the PEDs that we had talked about earlier. If everyone is on them, does that, does that really mean there's an edge now? No, because everybody's on them, right? You think about the Tour de France. Lance Armstrong got busted for blood doping or EPO or whatever he was using. That was his edge on everybody else, but everybody else is on drugs. There is no way any of those elite cyclists are not on drugs. It's just that Lance Armstrong had better drugs, right? Even with the Olympics. The Olympic athletes, I can't say they're all, but especially like in track and field, a lot of them are. And it just comes down to getting caught or not, right? Remember Marion Jones, she got caught. Her husband, actually she didn't get caught. In Sydney, Australia, she and her husband, who was I think a shot putter for the US team, he got caught. He wasn't using the same stuff she was using. And it turned out years later, she was on that stuff. I think Balco was the company that was giving her her drugs that were not detectable under that, the system they were using to check for drugs. But her husband was using a lower level drug that was easily detectable, so he was busted right away. She went on to win the gold medals. They eventually got taken away because they can go, they can claw back the medals when they find out, ah, in fact, you were. We got these Valco records that show that you were one of, one of his patients. If you can get away with it, that's just the way it is. It's not, it's, it is a gray area and it is cheating. Well, it is cheating. But if everybody's cheating, then, then is it cheating? Now, if the IBJJF is not going to do any drug tests on their winners, what's the incentive for being clean, right? You look at a lot of these champions and the way they're built, you know, these guys are ripped to shreds. You cannot train every day, both in jujitsu and in your 
your, your weight training program and expect to be able to recover. You cannot. It, it just doesn't work that way. Your body will break down. You can feed it all you want, but if you don't have those drugs to help you recover, you're not gonna. And the incentive to do it is so great because that's the difference between having 50 members in your school and 500 members in your school, right? You do that for a few years, you come out being the, the absolute world champion two, three, four times, you go off and retire, you can tell everybody, look, I, I was the champ of champions, right? Because that is the champ, that's the real champion. The real world champion is a black belt absolute champion. Not the black belt weight classes. They're all good, but the actual champion is the absolute champion. And if you are a multiple time absolute champion, then whatever you have to do to get to that point, um, you know, there's no more sandbag than black belt. You are, you're just a black belt. You do the drugs, you know, you train more, you get, uh, you get more conditioning, you do your technique, whatever you have to do to get that edge on everybody, it can mean a bunch of dollars down the road. So really that's where I am with regard to sandbagging. Sandbagging primarily is the belts, but it, it's, it's a form of cheating. If you're gonna compete, and as long as it's, there's no way to stop it. You wanna be successful in competition, you have to do it too. Hate to put it that way, but yeah. So if you're the victim of it, all I can say is I'm sorry. I mean, that's just the way the game, the way the game is played. If you want to be successful in competition, you got to do it too. Anyway, I hope that was helpful to you. And if you have any other questions or there's any topics that you want me to cover, or you want me to have Professor Jack or Professor Dave cover, I'd be happy to do it. Just let us know in the comments or private message us over at Kama Jiu Jitsu or on our Facebook page, um, or email us, kamajujitsu at gmail.com. I want to thank you for subscribing to our channel. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for liking. Thank you for commenting. All the comments have been great. We really appreciate it. And thanks for making the channel as successful as, as it's becoming. In the meantime, happy training. Bye-bye.